Today's episode is coming from our last live event. We're going to talk about cultural considerations, constructs, things you might have not considered around racism, systemic racism, uh, different things that work through the body. So you're going to hear me and Ta talking live to the attendees of the last training. And of course, today's episode is coming to you from Ka Empathogenics. Ka is short for Kana, which is a beautiful psychoactive plant that can help you calibrate your brain and naturally regulate your neurotransmitters and serotonin uptake. Say that five times fast. For me, it makes me feel more myself. All those fancy words to say if you've been looking for a tool, pre-ceremony, post-ceremony, or something you can legally start to learn how to integrate, grab Ka, grab the Condor Approach workbook off of Amazon, and you are going to be on the road to incredible integration that is not only optional, but intentional. Check out this episode. Whether you're a life coach, therapist, biohacker, invested in wellness, or in the healthcare profession, if you have an intention to work in psychedelic spaces, <laughs> you're in the right place then. If you're called, get involved. But first, get informed. Let's talk the four ends: intake, intention, in-space integration, leading to deeper transformations. Psychedelic Coach Podcast, Todd Cole, walk you through the process. It's all possible. Leave space for the follow-through. Most importantly, integration is not optional. All right, so check it. You already know about the Condor Approach, but did you know we have a one-day event coming up in Spanish Fork, Utah, August 1st? We're going to chat about uncovering the secrets of psychedelic integration to stay safe, connected, and fulfilled. If you want to discover how to navigate your psychedelic experiences with precision so that every step you take is aligned with your intentions and desired outcomes, this event is for you. It's just one day, lunch is included. If you want to learn about the first thing you could do when you return home after a big experience or why so many people slide backwards after a few weeks or months, how to find the right facilitator for you, the process that you're in, what questions to ask, how to share your wisdom and insights with those around you in your community, how to bridge the gap from the Western medicalized models in these ancient practices, your own unique framework that goes beyond just traditional methods or medicalized methods, and how to take your integration skills to the next level so that you can be a catalyst for change in the lives of others around you and really help to destigmatize and educate your community, then this is for you. So again, August 1st, admission is 297. We go from 9.30 a.m. until 7 p.m. in Spanish Fork, Utah. It's going to be an amazing event. If you want more information, I want to send it to you. So head on over to Instagram, The Condor Approach. Shoot me a message, whether you want to come to The Condor Approach, a one-day event, or you're not sure. You're like, Cole, I don't know. You do all of the things. I get it. So book a call with me. Yes? Or you can go to learnmore.coach. Book a call with me. We can go over all the things and find the right fit for you. Let's get back to the episode. Before Todd jumps into constructs, uh-oh. <laughs> I'll come back tomorrow. I would love to hear. We're going to grab three people that are that feel compelled and open to share their experience, whether it was this is your second round or more. We just want to hear three kind of reflections, realizations, breakthrough, understandings that's different. Come on, Q. Q's got something. Yeah, he's you had the look. He had the look for let's sure. Go, let's go. Yeah, he did the chin, the chin scratch. Yeah. <laughs> Peace. Can so, we turn it up a little? I don't really have anything different, but I will say, well, actually, yes. The difference was so Brittany <laughs> literally physically helped me shift into a different perspective. I mean, it's really simple, but I just want to honor Brittany and thank Brittany. For for that and I will definitely put that in my bag too so yes love thank it you. thank you Q Appreciate two you. more in the room oh I would uh, I know Q probably don't have the words all the words for what I did <laughs> in there. Um, 
But one of the things that we did that was for his situation was taking the action that was kind of showing up as an antagonist and finding where the action was or where the situation was on the oppression trap triangle instead of where the person was. And so once we realized, because he's an informed coach, and so I had to give him a twist so that he would give me the truth. And so once he kind of placed the thing on the triangle, it was like, oh, even though I don't identify as victim, this still feels like a victor. Um, and so what we did was a, a process-oriented hypnosis technique where he found the spot, he identified the feelings in his body, then he shifted his entire body, mm. then he shifted the entire place where he was focusing before to find, to place that situation in a new spot in the room. And then he did his strategy. He was able to speak to the thing. And he was doing it from a real place of gratitude because I think Q said that once he stood up versus sitting down, he felt confident and grateful. And so he was speaking to his strategy from that space versus that stuck feeling. So, Yay. Thank you. See, Saying. <laughs> so you see what I'm saying about dropping stuff into the condo approach? She dropped the hypnosis. She dropped everything that she knows. This is a framework and she's dropping stuff into it and utilizing it. Way to go. I got goosebumps, girl. Look, yeah. you can't see him from down here. Man. And part of the reason that we have you go do the state assessment so quickly is because we want you to get in the habit of like not really knowing. So you can't mess it up because we haven't even taught you enough to where you could even make that like an option. Because you don't know it well enough. So you're like, cool. So I don't know what I'm doing. Perfect. I'm on track. And as the days progress and we revisit it and we take you a little bit deeper, once you start getting into that triangle component, you start to see the complexity of emotions and why people get so upset in certain situations. Like you can see their side of it. Doesn't mean you agree. You just recognize that the reaction is coming from these multiple complexes happening simultaneous, simultaneously. Roots, for you, what was illuminating for you, if you're open to share? I think what was illuminating for me was that uh, in our conversation, my situation was that the thing that I am kind of running away from right now, which is my current nine to five, because I'm like, this is not where I need to be. I just got a phone call from someone that I don't know at my nine to five asking me about my men's work program, which has nothing to do with my nine to five and how I would be able to help mentor her son. And it just was like this, oh, wait a minute. First of all, I didn't even want to pick up the phone because I knew it was work related. But then it was like, because the message was, I have a personal question for you. It made me feel like, okay, maybe I should investigate. And it just was showing me that, okay, not only am I in the place that I need to be, which is here, but I'm also in the place that I need to be, which is there, because I'm showing something to someone and to a group of people that don't have access to that. Like they don't know anything about men's work or doing medicine or intention setting, but they have a representative within their nine to five job that she's like, why is this guy even here talking about men's work on a sales call? But I must have. I don't even remember when I said it. But she was like, I remember you saying this, I don't know how long ago, but I remember it was you and I wanted to reach out to you for this specific thing right now. And so, yeah, it was just very uplifting for me. And it definitely made me feel amazing that I was there to even give her that option. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean for you moving forward? that I'm definitely going to be grateful, more grateful for where I'm at every single day because there's a reason for me to be there. And it's more just like when we were speaking about before, not trying to get rid of the pain, which I must say my shoulder is feeling way better than it was this morning. But it's not even necessarily always about trying to get away from something, but recognizing what do I need in this moment right now? And where am I best to be served? Because I want to be of service, but sometimes I'm thinking I need to be of service somewhere else. So maybe I need to just slow down, do my three Ps, 
and see what really needs to be happening in the present moment. Snap to that. And this is the thing that's like, sometimes it's simply not time. And this is where you have to be careful with all of these like coaching techniques where it's like, if I was doing it right, I wouldn't still be here, right? I wouldn't still be in a nine to five or I wouldn't still be leaning on a side job. I would just make the leap. If it's not time, no matter how much you try to force it, nothing will work. And so that's why Ta and I say, if it's not time and someone's not done, you just have to wait. That's part of the work too. But when you recognize, well, if I'm not done, then what is there here still to learn? There's still something, there's still gold here that once I find it, I'll be released to move on my path. But I have not found the key to the next piece yet. And like you said, if we all just abandon regular society and go into our medicine circles, it becomes exclusive because we use the terminology and the language and that bridge is lost because then someone comes to one event and they hear abundance and manifestation and their walls go up. They can't relate to the language because the context changes. And so even in recognizing like, what if that is what you're still there for is because you're that bridge until enough people have crossed it that you don't have to be on that side of the bridge anymore because enough have crossed the bridge to send more people down the path to you versus you having to go to them a little bit more. And that's why for us, the body will inform that. If you start asking those kinds of questions, when you start on those reflections in the condor approach, really saying, what on my calendar is creating contraction? What's creating more vitality and space? Why? And Todd's going to talk more about the yellow brick road. He guides people down and getting more clarity on it. Then we start to find, oh, if I flip how I'm, how I'm looking at this is not that I'm not doing this right, but it, that's not the assignment yet. And that's it. I've taken plenty of side jobs. I have never had any problems scrubbing toilets, cleaning houses, whatever, at times that I didn't have bread. No problem. Because I recognize when it's not time. And that's part of the nuance is sometimes it's just not now. So there's other skills that have to be developed to become the person destined to run the thing you're meant to do like the bigger picture thing. So if it hasn't come into fruition, it's because you have not become the person with the skill sets to run the thing yet or to launch the thing yet. Not because you're a deficit, but because in order to truly step into it, you need more parts. There's just more pieces to go and that's it. And when you can sink into the daily gratitude of going, oh, so this is still a game I'm here to play. Well, then what would happen if I talked about my men's groups a whole lot more in a way that works for the environment, what would happen? Can't wait to see. Uh, nice deep breath, y'all. <sighs> so if you could wave a magic wand in the next three days, what would you want to know, do, be, or understand from our knowledge that we could access or that is resourced within the room? You might, have been, you might realize you only came to this event to find the medicine person you're meant to work with next. Sometimes that's where sometimes people don't know why they end up here. And then they meet someone, they're like, it wasn't us. It is who this attracts sometimes that brings someone here. Nice deep breath, y'all. <sighs> Constructs. Oh, <laughs> 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 All the new people in the room, don't be scared. Constructs used to be reserved to a day, right? We call it construct day. And so we're ending off the day with constructs today because we want you to be able to actually get some rest and sleep on it. We would put this at the beginning of the day and it would be a very big day with a lot more material on top of it. So constructs are a, a topic that we are leaning into with the condor approach because we don't hear anybody else leaning into talking about constructs. Now, there's something that I've been working on. I'm actually working on a piece to deliver a scientific paper on construct trauma and the trauma around constructs. And it's something that people are not looking at. And so I'm just going to move over a little bit because this light is beaming in my face and I want to be able to kind of see y'all. Is that cool? And Cole's not on stage, so I could just have all this shit to myself. It's like when Cole's not in the bed, I'm like. <laughs> so. <clears throat> you could lean into it and integrate. <laughs> 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 so.
So constructs, construct trauma is a big deal. And so the way we work at the Condor approach is we have something called the hierarchy of esteem. And I'm going to talk to you all about this at a point. But human beings, tend to, we tend to hold ourselves in esteem. Thank you, Omar. Now no, I really can't see them. <laughs> it's cool. Don't worry about it. It's cool. Don't worry about it. It's good. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. As long as the light works for you, I'm good. I can move around. You're so wonderful, Omar. I love you. Construct trauma is a big deal. And we have this thing called a hierarchy of esteem. Human beings tend to hold themselves in esteem, meaning value, what we value ourselves in. And we tend to hold that esteem in a hierarchy. And at the top of that hierarchy, if you could imagine a totem pole, right? Everybody knows what a totem pole is? Okay, cool. Anybody not know what a totem pole is? Cool. At the top of the totem pole is spirituality, right? Below that, we hold our mind and our mental processes where our idea spaces are. Below that, we hold our constructs. Our constructs would be things like our identity, race, religion, gender, ethnicity, nationality, and so on, right? Our family structures. Below that, we hold our heart, intuition, and emotion space. Below that, we put the body. And below that, we put the microbiome, which is all the microorganisms that live in us and on us. And so what we do at the Connor approach is we take that totem pole and we turn it sideways so that all of those aspects of the self are in the same esteem and then we bring them together so that they integrate and work together as a whole. That's a whole individual human being recognized as whole. We stop taking ourselves and putting ourselves into pieces and parts. We bring it together. Now that construct space is very high up on the totem pole. And when we consider trauma, the way we talk about trauma, now I'm an ER nurse, okay? I worked in an emergency room for 23 of my 25 clinical years in nursing. So I'd like to somebody to come tell me some shit about being trauma-informed, okay? I know about trauma. And the lens that I look at trauma through is trauma is not what happens to you. It's not the circumstance that happens to you. It's how your organism, and I'm talking about all of those aspects are your organism, how your body, your mind, your spirit, your heart, all these things respond to a threat, okay? To violence. What are the seven attributes of violence? Hurt, harm, loss, deficit, injury, death, pain. You see how all this stuff comes back around? Everything full circle. Trauma is the threat of being outside of safety or the actuality of being outside of safety. It is your response to that, okay? So fight would be to fight against something that's coming towards you. Flight would be running away from it, okay? And so we have very intricate ways of fighting with things and very intricate ways of running away from things, including hiding, avoidance, right? dissonance, all of these things are flight mechanisms. And so I just want to bring this into the space. Does this stuff make sense? Am I losing anybody? Is anybody not on board with this? Because I just want to make sure you're in a context space. And don't be afraid if you're not, I can slow down and re-explain it in a different way if you need it. Okay, it's really important that we get into a context space where you understand this stuff when we're talking about constructs. Cool. So a construct is a functional structure or a framework that serves a particular purpose or multiple purposes. It is a framework. This building that we are in is a construct. It serves a particular purpose or multiple purposes. Somebody shout out a purpose of this building. Shelter, protection, safety. What? Aesthetic. Go ahead. Who else? Comfort. What else? What? Condor, it is, right? It's also keeping the cool air in, keeping the hot air out, keeping the animals and the bugs out, maybe mostly, right? All of these, it serves a lot of stuff. So it's a structure. It's a functional structure and a framework. And so it's easy. You don't have to, once you build it, it's in place and it's been built for something. You don't have to think about it. You're not worried about the insects and the bugs. You're not worried about the longhorns. You got the fence. All of these things are structured to provide one main thing, convenience, so when you look at our societal constructs, our race, religion, gender, ethnicity, nationality, family structure, relationship structure, all of these things are convenient spaces that we don't have to think about it, right? And so we can put something like marriage. People would be like, oh, Ta and Cole are married, so I can't go flirt with Ta, right? Because, <laughs> please, 
please flirt with me. Somebody, please, everybody flirt with me. So, <laughs> so, 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 but people have their constructs, right? And there are these overarching constructs of how something should be. And when we put the should on it, we don't get intimate with it. We don't ask. I'm open to flirting with anybody. I'm just saying. <laughs> so <clears throat> we have different types of constructs. We have physical constructs. We have life forms, right? I'm a human construct. Those longhorns out there are physical constructs as well. They are life forms. The trees outside, those are constructs. They consist of a, a culmination of elements and chemicals and stuff. We have buildings. We have natural formations like rocks, mountains, right? Lakes are constructs. We have imagination. Imagination is the space where we take information and we bring it together. Societal constructs. We have scientific constructs. We have economical constructs. Our financial systems are economical constructs. And we have ideological constructs, which are my ideas. I have these belief structures that we, that we build into, and we'll talk more about that. Once a societal construct is developed, it works through the people who ascribe to it. So my family structure means nothing if nobody is ascribing to it. It doesn't hold any weight. And so when constructs are not being used anymore, they fade away. They're no longer useful. They're defunct. And so since they're defunct, they actually they get dismantled. And the only way they have to live is through us as individuals. And so people would be like, we got to keep the family going. We got to keep the family going no matter what. How many people have heard something like that before? No matter what, we got to keep the family going, but there's all this dysfunction in the family. This person's raping that person. This person's selling this person something terrible about themselves. Yet we keep that structure going because we got to keep it. We got to keep it going, right? Because we are told that. How many people are in religions where it's like, we have to adhere to the religion no matter what. We got to adhere to the government structure. There are people in this state that if you speak off about the United States of America, they will pull out a gun and shoot you in your fucking face. There are patriots that would all over this country that will shoot you in your fucking face. There are people that will shoot you in your face talking about Texas. Okay? Because their construct of allegiance is so strong. Okay? And so it only lives through people. It doesn't live without you. And so be mindful of the constructs you've been handed to you that have been embedded into you by parents, that have been embedded into you by societies, that have been embedded to you by religions that you really don't feel aligned with. Be mindful of them. I'm not saying to ascribe to anything or not. That's your choice. This is your ride. And I'm down for people to be sovereign. But if they're not aware of what's going on, are they really sovereign? And if people don't want to be sovereign and they want to be slaves, they can do that shit over there as far as I'm concerned. This is the kind of situation I'm, I'm going to be involved in. Does anybody in this room want to be a slave? Yeah. There's always one, baby. <laughs> as long as Zer is like with the whips and shit. <laughs> well, all right, damn it. You got me up here blushing and shit. All right. So constructs literally. <laughs> All right. I love y'all so much. So con constructs literally live through people like an entity. Okay. They live through you. Okay. They are entities. They are entities. They are alive through you like parasites, okay? And so this is where things, or symbiotic, right? Like parasites. Parasites are, if you think that there's no parasites in your body family. No, I'm saying, because parasites can be seen as something that eats off you, but you're not eating off you, right? So I guess my question would be, uh, is that symbiotic? Yeah, I'm saying parasites are symbiotic too. Uh, yeah. They can be. Viruses the viruses are symbiotic. Bacteria is symbiotic. So we have a bunch of symbiosis going on. And not everything that lives in us and on us is terrible. And so if we were to kill off everything that was living inside us, we'd have a, a rough time with a lot of stuff. There are parasites that eat certain microorganisms that are all, that are actually great for you. So it's not a, a tremendous amount, but when they overgrow, they kill you. 
right? And so it's just like bacteria or anything else. There's symbiosis. So thank you for that, Sincere. Thank you for bringing that up. So constructs can work with each other or against one another. And we're going to talk about multi-construct strain in a little bit. There are walls, doors, and structures. There are, they are walls, doors, and structures holding someone together. I didn't do this slide. I don't know where this came from. Okay. So <laughs> I, that's not my slide. This one. That's not my slide. So a construct slid in there and put that in there. It's cool. So identity constructs. Who are you? Now, this is something that on my, in my, if you were to open my journals, my personal journals, and look, there's a question I ask myself every day. Who are you? Who am I without my name, without my occupation, and without what I am in my relationship with Cole? Who am I in this very moment? And it was a challenge when I first started doing that to be like, I'm a nurse. I'm a father. I'm this father. I'm this dad. Who am I foundationally? And so in order for me to not have to dive into that space it's too deep all the time, I can just be like, I'm Ta. Well, who the fuck is that? So I believe I am who I am. So your identity constructs start, the very foundation is your identity. I believe I am who I am. I believe you believe I am who I am. I believe you believe I am who I am. I believe you. I believe you believe I am who I am. I believe y'all two believe I am who I am. Then I believe y'all three believe I am who I am. Then I believe all y'all of on this side believe I am. That I believe y'all over here believe I am who I am. That I believe all of y'all believe I am who I am. And then I believe we believe I am who I am. You see how complex that can get? And I can, you're talking to a person who lied about everything in his life for everything. So I had a lie for everybody that I had to keep track of. So I had an identity for everybody that I came across. So my life was very complex and complicated at the same time. And it's one of the reasons I had insomnia for 30 years because I had to keep up with all my lies. And so my lies were identities in and of themselves. Do you see how complex this can get? And that's on the surface level. The next level is, I believe that you believe that I believe I am who I am. Okay? And so since I believe I am who I am, I believe you believe I am who I am, I believe that you believe that I believe that I am who I am, shit gets really complex. But we're playing in these spaces and we're not aware of it. Okay? And so we've created and crafted all this shit. And so if I'm in a household with Cole and I'm crafting how I want her to see me and I have three other people that are living in the house and I'm keeping secrets from Cole, but I'm not keeping secrets with this person, but this person can't know because they might get back to Cole, shit gets complex, right? And so a lot of us have made this tangled web that we live in with a lot of different constructs. So who are you? is an interesting question and I always ask it to all my clients and it's a stopping point. Who are you? No, I'm, I, well, I work as a nurse. No, that's what you do. Who are you? And when you, once you get down to the foundation, this will rock people's worlds. So be mindful and be very gentle with yourselves when you start asking this question. What's my answer when I start taking away all those things? Uh, right now? Who am I right now? I'm the organism sitting on the stage. Expressing through source this information that has been moving through me in the middle of the night and for the past 51 years that is overjoyed. That's who I am in this moment right now. It'll change in five minutes. This morning I was the person, I was the organism that was frustrated with the sound and the shit that was going on that I couldn't get going right earlier. When I woke up this morning, I was the person who slept like a rock, right? Like all of these, I'm all these different things. I'm constantly changing. And so it's always shifting. And so I'm doing my best to be present with who I am, not tied to a particular identity space because I could change in a minute. I could wake up and be like, I'm done with all this shit. And would y'all support me in that? Does your environment support you in your decisions? Even if those decisions don't make you smile, and this, we talk about freedom. Freedom is a very interesting sport, y'all. It's a very interesting sport, and it is not for the faint of heart. So if you want to talk about freedom, then let's get free. If you want to talk about slavery, keep wearing them shackles. Because we've all been born into slavery. I hope that 
feeds that question, family. Does that work for you? Okay, cool. So identity is how you perceive yourself relative to the rest of the world and how the rest of the world perceives you. It's the self's relation to the self and the world's relation to the self. It is extremely dense, extremely. Children from the age of, of conception to seven don't have very much of an identity. They're starting to learn what that means. But their parents project on them, oh, we don't do that. We're Jewish, we're Catholic, we're black, we're Protestant, we're white, we're Asian. We are projected these things and then we take them and we embed them and we hold on to them and we live for them in reference to other people. It can be very challenging for somebody who doesn't grow up with all of this indoctrination. And I don't know many people who have grown up without this type of indoctrination. It's convenient to put people into a particular, a particular grade of humanity and put them over there. We, have, we still have caste systems on this planet, racial wars and all these crazy shit going on, ethnic cleansing and all this stuff on our planet based on how people were, how we project into one another. So be mindful, family, of what you project into yourself and to other people. Does this make sense? Okay. How's everybody doing? Is this shaking some shit up for some people? Okay. Cool. Belief is a construct. You believe, what you believe or are taught you should believe, right? And so you can choose to believe something or you can be taught to believe something. Most societal constructs are based upon belief. I believe I am a man because I have this plumbing. I grow hair on my face. I like to be around women and men and whatever else, <laughs> right? Whatever, it doesn't make a difference. Like, so all of these things are belief structures. And so there's something that comes with belief that I really want y'all to listen to. And I haven't dove into this in previous condor approaches very much, but belief comes paired with doubt. Whenever you have a belief structure, there is a doubt attached to it. Whenever you have a doubt, there is a belief structure attached to it. Well, I believe I'm a man, so I believe that I'm not a woman, right? And so there's a belief structure, okay? And so I believe that I'm American, and Americans are the best. Are you sure? Well, yeah, let me prove it to you. If I have to prove something, there's a belief structure. When I know something, there's no doubt. I am in a conviction space. I can tell you that I have skin. I know that. There's no doubt. I know that I have a mother. I know that. There is no doubt. But when we have a structure, it makes things very easy to look at. Knowing is very complex. It's very complex and it's always changing. Your knowledge changes every moment. All of you here are not 15 years old. You've been doing shit your whole lives and maybe now... You're starting to really get into the foundation of your knowing and your belief structures are getting shaken up by these things. All the asking, all the questioning, all the things you haven't considered because you've had a belief structure placed on top of you so that you can't see the rawness of what you are. An ever-changing, ever-evolving human being that is of source, that comes from something that is greater than all this shit. And when you put it together and see that you come from something greater than all this shit, you are greater than all this shit. And when you move the belief structures that you're small, when you move the belief structures that you're not enough, when you move the belief structures that you're bad, that you're broken, that you're too much, that you're not enough, when you move that shit out of the way, what are you? Foundationally, you are limitless. That's my knowledge point. That's why I do this work, because I know my limitlessness. But every once in a while, my belief structures come in and I start doubting myself. Because if I believe that I'm not enough, I'm doubting that I am enough. And this is where belief structures come in. Does this make sense? Okay. Is this resonating? Cool. Just want to make sure. Yeah. All right. So interpersonal relationships are constructs. I don't know what's going on with my, uh, my monitor down here. So interpersonal relationships. Is the Zoom still on, Harry? Okay, let's check it. Yeah, okay. So, 
So after the relationship to the self, the relationship between two people is the foundation of societal interaction. So person to person, our interactions, those relationships are constructs. And so when I assume somebody is my friend, oh, you're my friend. Did I discuss what friendship is? Or did I take my ideas that my mom told me? That's, oh, you have a little friend. Did I take whatever my mother told me a friend is and apply it to every other person moving forward in my life? Did I take what a husband is on the Brady Bunch from Mike, watching Mike Brady, Mike and Carol, that's what it was. Did I take that and apply that to mom and dad and husband and wife? And did I apply that to everybody? Am I projecting? Am I taking these things? These interpersonal relationships are foundation. And so if we're crafting relationship structures outside of our own awareness, that can be uh, an issue. I got my first marriage. I asked this woman, I was like, hey, before we got married, I said, hey, I want to know, what is marriage to you? And she said, what do you mean, what is marriage to me? Because we had got, we were getting ready. She wanted to get engaged and shit. And I was like, well, what is marriage to you? And she was like, what do you mean? If you don't know what marriage is to me, then we don't need to be discussing anything. And she stopped talking to me for two weeks. I was in the doghouse for asking her what marriage was because I wanted to actually create something together. She wasn't with that shit. She was with what her mom told her marriage was. And her mom it was never stayed married. And so she was looking to create that type of dynamic. And I went down a rabbit hole with that. Erica knows all about it. Cole knows all about it. Shit was a nightmare. Okay. But I didn't craft my relationship. Now, my relationship with Cole, we actually sit down every year. We get out poster boards and we discuss what we didn't like the last year and what we loved and what we want to create moving forward. And so we're actively crafting our relationship. So our interpersonal relationship is something that we craft. We don't take this shit for granted. We don't slow. People don't slow down. They jump right into shit. I know people that are getting married after being in a relationship for two months. Oh, this is the person that I want to be with for the rest of my life. Sounds good. Two months later, they're apart. They haven't taken the time to invest. So the interpersonal relationship is a construct that's very convenient when it works. When it doesn't work, that shit is... How many people have been in an inconvenient-ass relationship? No? Oh, okay, just checking. I'm getting these short, I'm getting the short arms. That's what's going on. Yeah, so I've been in a highly inconvenient-ass relationship. That's right, inconvenient-ass relationships. And that's because I didn't discuss. I didn't put stuff on the line. I didn't create the relationship. So after the interpersonal relationship, oh, the interpersonal relationships, we have friendships, intimate partnerships, we have marriages, we have coworker relationships, we have business partner relationships. These are, in, these are very important circumstances. Family is the next level up. These are people we deem our, or title our close familiar people. Now this often gets mixed up with relatives and kin. They are not the same thing. We can put them in that same context, but they're not the same thing. When I say to you family, when I call you family, it's because my interest is to become familiar with you and for you to become familiar with me to whatever degree that is that you are comfortable with, that you're down to flow with. I'm down to dive deep. I don't like surface level shit. That's me. You may like surface level stuff, but how familiar are you? Is that person an associate or a family member? There are people that are my blood relatives that know nothing about what I do, how I do it, where I've been, or anything like that. These people are my kinfolk, and, I, and they don't know me very well, and I don't know them very well, but we're blood-related, and people say blood is thicker than water. I've been injured more by, by my blood relatives than I have by any other humans on this planet, any other, plan, any other person on this planet, physically, emotionally injured, okay? And so... That, that is something that I just want to bring to the surface, y'all. Family is a very important space. Now, relatives are people who are bound to one another by bloodline, ancestry, lineage, and at times legal system connections through adoption. Okay? You can be a relative through adoption. Kin is exclusive, exclusive to direct bloodline. Okay? I can have a relative that is not in my bloodline. And... This is a space when you're working with people, or maybe you have been in this space yourself if you're doing your own coaching stuff. When you have children that are stepkids 
and you call, this is my stepson. That is a dangerous space. Okay? When you are parenting somebody and you call them your stepchild in front of other people, you are actually pulling yourself back from those people. Okay? And this is a trauma space that I've seen over and over again. Well, my step, my stepmother calls me my steps, her stepson and the step. And I've been with this person my whole life and I've been a step kid. Dangerous space. Okay. Very traumatic space. And it starts to stir shit up in people all over the planet. My stepson, my stepmom, it, there's a division space. Does this make sense? Okay. So when we have relatives and if you're going to raise a kid, if, for me, if I'm going to raise a kid, I'm going to raise a kid. That's it. That's my kid. I have two grandsons, okay? I have one that is a blood, a, a blood kin relation and one that is a relative that is not my blood. He is my grandson, okay? That's it. He is, a rel- he is, a, he is my relative. He is my family. I'm, I love this kid. And Cole doesn't call him, him her, his her step grandson or some shit like that. That's her grandson. So, but this is a choice space. And when we choose to be familiar with people, that's when we make people our family. And so we can make relatives our family. We can make kin our family, but this doesn't mean that they are our familiar people. And so when you hear us use the term family, this is the context that we are working from. And so when you're navigating these spaces with your clients, with yourselves, with your friends, and you see these separation points, you can actually delineate this and use this language to support yourself and these other people in moving to a space of ease by actually asking them about their relationships. It's fascinating how people separate things. And you can see if a person is leaning into a relationship fully, leaning into raising somebody fully, leaning into being with somebody fully by how they by how they associate with that person, how familiar they're really leaning into. If, they, if there's a baby daddy or a baby mama that's, some, that's involved with somebody else, there may be a separation of getting close to that kid. And that's a traumatic circumstance because if you have a household with two parents in it and one parent's not leaning into that kid, it can be a traumatic space for that child. So I just want to bring that up, y'all. Does this make sense? Okay, so be mindful of your language with yourself. Be mindful of your intention. Remember, in space, intention, intake. I mean, sorry, intake, intention, in space, integration. Okay, even with your family, same situation. What's your intention with your kids? What's your intention with your family members, with your relatives? Community. Community is the group of people we tend to rally around based on common interest, circumstances, or geographic location. Now, people talk a lot of stuff about the psychedelic community. What the living shit is that? The psychedelic community. I'm in the psychedelic community. Where where is that? It's some belief structure. Well, you should act that way because you're in the conscious community. How many people hear that shit? Oh, bro, the conscious community. Oh, you're supposed to be conscious. What the fuck does that mean? What does that mean? This is the conscious community. What is that? What are the rules for that? And I can go to New York. Huh? huh? <laughs> Grand rising, fam. Grand rising. <laughs> Grand rising. You got the Ashe Ashe. Well, I mean, I, I, I be on my Ashe's, though. I be on my Ashe's. I'm saying, I say, I say, family. (laughs) So, but uh, this is a thing, y'all. The community space is a space where people start to separate in groups. Okay, we have families that that consider themselves separated, but communities are bigger groups, and this is where people start to activate. And this is a space that's based on common circumstance, common interest, or geographic location. So I just want to bring that to the attention space. Religions. Religious constructs are frameworks in which specific spiritual or worship-based belief systems attain their doctrine and methodologies for behavior and function. Okay? That's what a religion does. It's a framework. Okay? It's a framework. I believe in this. We believe in this. And so we're over here, and we can associate with one another. 
because of this framework. And we have large groups of people in religions, large groups, and it bonds people together. You can have people, you can have people wearing certain outfits from certain religions. They can go anywhere in the world and be recognized and taken in based on that belief structure, based on that, on, on how they show up and how they appear. So religions are very powerful frameworks. Okay. They do not have to be a spiritual situation, right? Some people, the United States being a citizen of the United States is a religion for some people. It is a framework that's based, that's based with spiritual or worship situations. And there are people who worship countries like the Patriot people in this country, they worship this country. And so it's not isolated to, to uh, spirituality. Cool. Nationality is a grouping based upon the country that one is born into or pledges allegiance to. There are lots of people in the United States of America that were not born here, that were naturalized into being American and they pledge allegiance. And so it's a grouping based upon the country one is born into or pledges allegiance to, right? So race is a, categor- is a categorizing of humans based upon physical characteristic, a physical characteristic or a trait such as skin color or the shape of their eyes, okay? And the shape of the eyes is something that, that I want to put in there because people get put in, in these race spaces based on their physical characteristics, This is a construct. Race is a construct. It is made up. And we adhere to it. It is a way of separating people. It's a way of identifying those people over there and us over here. It's a construct. And I'm not saying it doesn't serve purposes. It serves plenty of purposes. Some people will believe the purposes are good. Some people will believe they're bad. It's a convenient space of identifying people. That's it. All of these are convenient structures and frameworks. How are we doing, everybody? Just checking in. Okay. Because in Utah, when we did, we we talked about some of this stuff, some shit came up. Ethnicity. Ethnicity is a categorizing of humans based upon ancestral, cultural, social, or national experiences. Okay. So ethnicity race and nationality can all be different, right? And so I can be an Israeli and religion, right? I can be an Israeli Jew who's actually Christian, right? <laughs> who's Asian, right? Who's of an Asian race and my ethnicity could be uh, <sighs> no, that would be a nationality. I I could be Taino. I could be Taino, right? So I could be all these different things all in the same person. Okay? This is, do you see how, this, how complex this gets? This is very complex. We are very dense, y'all. We're dense. And so if you don't know what's dwelling within you, where your cultural circumstances and situations come from, and people point fingers at you, and you start to question yourself, because your belief structures and who you are don't match what they're telling you, their belief structures are who you are. I believe I am who I am. You believe that I am who I am. And then I believe that you believe that I am. You see how complex this shit gets? Okay, this is a very deep web that we get woven into really quickly from the age of eight to 14. And by the time we get to 14, we have all this stuff sewn in and we are questioning ourselves. And this is where we have rebellion. This is why teenagers are so rebellious because they're looking to really identify with who they are and who they've been told that they are. And by the time we go from 14 to 21 years old, society will whip us back into shape. Nope, you get back over there. You get a job. You do what you're supposed to do. You be an an avid student of this American culture. You be this type of religion or that type of religion. You do what you got to do or I'm going to send you to this special school, or I'm going to send you to jail because you're not conforming with what society says you need to be. Some dangerous shit, y'all. And it is dangerous to who you are at a foundational level. Dangerous as far as violence is concerned. 
violence in pulling you apart from the wholeness that you are inherently in. Deep breath, y'all. <sighs> Gender is what a person identifies with as being male, female, both, neither, or any combination in between male and female. Okay? Very dense space. And it's a topic of a lot of disturbing situations right now in the world. It's a construct. When we look at somebody and we say, that is a man, that is a woman, that is a trans person, that is a this, that is, it's all a construct. And it's for convenient spaces. And if somebody steps outside of your convenience of your identity for another person, it can cause you to be pretty upset and traumatized. Your construct of what that person is is now traumatized. Your construct is now traumatized. And so you act on its behalf and you protect it with anger, with sadness, with whatever comes up. If you're not content with somebody being who they are or what they've determined that they are, are you going to be upset about it? Are you going to be joyous about it? What are you going to do? It's entirely up to you. But are you aware of what you're doing? Are you aware of what you're conforming to? Are you aware of who you're speaking to? Are you aware? Really important stuff. Does this resonate? Just checking, y'all. <clears throat> so gender versus sex. Gender is often confused with a person's sex. Sex is the idea of what a person is determined to be by their physical state of being male or female. That's what sex is. Your biological sex. It's the idea based on your plumbing of what you are. So you can identify. It's convenient. It's convenient. I see somebody with some bumps up here, long hair, sashay in them. I'm like, hey, it's Paul Mark. <laughs> right? So, so it all depends on how you were raised and what you were told. Boys do this and girls do this. We put a truck in a boy's hand and a doll in a girl's hand. And we groom them into these spaces. That's what we do. We don't have to, though. We could. Politics. Constructs. Big constructs. Pol political structure is the connection to a governmental style. Usually complicated mixes of various societal constructs that are united to bring semblance of order to people with varying interests without there being chaos. That's what polit political structures do. They stop chaos from happening by providing a very tight rein on things. You have to do this and do this way, or we're going to put you in jail and make an example of you so all of these people don't kill each other. So all of these people don't take their shit. And these political structures, once people know how to use these things, they can use them for whatever they want. And so we have... Lots of really corrupt politics going on on our planet. And there are some awesome political structures on our planet. I'm not here to claim the devil or claim God in any of these things, but both of them are both. I mean, all of them are both. And so how you see it, how you visualize it, how you expand on it, how you lean into it is your choice. And this is, what we're this is the world we're living in, a world of political structure. We have eight point two billion people walking around on this planet. There's like, what, 40 of y'all in here? 8.2 billion people. I can't even fathom that. Looking at 8.2 billion people all at the same time. We need structures in place to support people not killing each other, right? And the structures that are in place to stop people from killing each other, are they all righteous spaces i dare say most of them are not and are we in a space to support other human beings in creating structures that are highly functional for us being sovereign and still not killing each other and supporting each other and being whole can we do that and i believe that we can that's why we're doing this that's why we're creating an operating that's why we've created we've brought through an operating system for you to drop your shit into so that you can support yourself and other people around you Fanaticism. This is what brought some, I think this is what brought some shit up in, the, was it, I think it was in Utah. Yeah, it was in Utah. We, a categorizing of people 
based upon their dedication to an individual person, a group of individuals, or a genre based on their specialty. So this is where sports fandom comes from, right? Sports fandom comes in and people have had fights and I've seen some crazy shit go down. I went to Philadelphia with a friend that had a Mets jersey on and they started throwing shit. They started throwing shit like people are crazy with that stuff. But this is a, it's a space and this is something that not a lot of people lean into. And when I asked this question in, when I, when we brought this question up in Utah, it stirred up the room for a good 45 minutes. It was a wow. Somebody had a tattoo of, of a sports team on their arm and didn't realize how deep the, this shit went down the rabbit hole. And when you have parents that push sports on you, when you have parents that push a particular agenda on you, it can be a fanatic place. So be mindful of fanaticism in yourself. Anybody have some fanatic tendencies? Huh? Same TV shows? Please, people, please. Music artists? Elvis, that's right. <laughs> huh? Motorcycles, yeah, Harley Davidson, that's right. So you get all these things. Uh, driver, driving, what, iPhone? iPhone versus Android? Fanaticism. All, I've seen people have fights over this stuff. And working in the ER, you want to talk about some shit. One of the, there's days that you just don't want to work as an ER nurse. You don't want to work Halloween. Well, you do kind of do and don't want to work Halloween because the outfits that come in are outrageous. You never want to work New Year's. You never want to work on a full moon in the ER. And you never want to work during the Super Bowl or the Super Bowl, the World Series, or the PGA, the, the golf shit. What? Golf people? Whoa. Golf people are violent. People put, listen, people bet a lot of money on golf. And it's people with bread that put money on, and people will be fighting over golf. But foot, but the Super Bowl, you don't want to work during the Super Bowl. Don't do it. Don't do it. Because fanatics come in there and they will fight in the ER over shit. They'll come in jerseys, people will be drunk and sloshed, and he'd be like, fuck your team, fuck your team, in the ER. Nope. It's crazy. Nice deep breath, y'all. <sighs> Is anything coming up for anybody? Okay. <laughs> you you want to speak on it? Okay. Huh? Oh, okay. Hey, grab a mic. Could we get a mic over here? Is this on? Yeah, okay. Is this thing on? Is this thing on? Can you hear me now? So earlier you said separation was one of the biggest issues, right? And I wrote down that constructs create separation, like under the guise of bonding. Then when you were talking about like the self where you're like, you might be Asian and you might come from an Italian family and you might be Israeli and you might all, all these things. I was like, so constructs even create a deeper separation of self which is why when you have someone, like for example, I had a conversation with someone about how Americans are so interesting because we're like, we're Italian and I'm, I'm, I'm Irish. And like, we'd say all these different things and an Irish person will be like, yeah, I'm, they don't really say I'm Irish. They're just like, I'm from Ireland. And I always talk to people. I'm like, yeah, because we have so many different old identities from things that we were just a melting pot, even in ourselves, of everybody coming here. And so when you said, like, you deny those parts in the separation of the self, that's why there's so much, like, sometimes turmoil. Mm -hmm. And I even think about when they do those DNA tests and the, like, the guy will be like, oh, I can't stand Germans or something like that. And then he finds out that he's, like, 27% German. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, first of all, that does create a, separ a deeper separation of self? And you see that a lot? I do. Yeah. I do see it a lot. And I can speak firsthand. Yeah. Would you like to hear some firsthand? Yeah. So, <clears throat> you see my skin? <laughs> right. What do you believe I identify as? 
<laughs> yeah, she said it. Well, yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to say, he's 100% that bitch and sexy. That's what, sexy. What do you think I, what do you believe I identify as? I was going to say loving because I know you, uh -huh. but probably mixed if you were to, I guess. Mixed, if, uh, mixed what? Mixed African-American. I don't know. That's what my siblings refer as is mixed. Don't worry about, you don't have to worry about like filtering. Just speak what you think. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. I literally just yeah. mixed. Your breath is getting a little short, honey. Are you feeling safe right now? Yeah. Okay, just check in. So I, I was raised and I was told that I'm black. And so that's what I identify with greatly. Okay. Well, when I look in the mirror, my skin is light. So there is something in here besides black. Okay. And so I've been taught to deny anything other than I am black. Mm -hmm. Anything, okay? I can feel it, well, I can feel my, I can feel tears welling up in my eyes right now, okay, as I speak about this. Mm -hmm. Because it's programmed so deeply into my body that if I acknowledge any whiteness in me, it's problematic for my system. Because it's problematic for the people in my neighborhood, it's problematic for everybody. And so there's a denial of the whiteness that lives in my bloodstream in my DNA structure, okay? There's a denial of anything other than blackness. I was not raised to that. My, my mom, would, I would ask my mother, what am I? She'd say, you're black. I'm like, but mommy, my skin is this way. She's like, I don't care, you're black. And that's it. And so look at your hair. You have hair like black people. <laughs> when I started growing my hair, my, the white people I know are like, oh, you really are black. <laughs> 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 and so because they couldn't recognize they could not see it when my head was shaved so closely. And so the denial of these aspects of myself, has, there is generational trauma in my body that is from the slave trade, mm -hmm. but it's not just from the black people. Yeah. It's the white people in their generational trauma and the tyrannical nature of whatever happened and transpired in their families' lives. I have Scottish Irish in my blood. My last name is Witty. I am from the Witty family. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? And so I did my DNA shit, and I don't know how accurate any of those things are, but I have Nigerian, West African, like, I think I'm like 49% West African, and then there's 12% Ashkenazi Jew, and there's, yeah, there's all this He's shit. He's all the oppressed there, people. And, and so all the oppressed people, right? And so where am I in the space of the denial of that? And so a lot of the work that I've done with people in journey spaces has been around the acknowledgement of all the aspects of the self that they had not been seeing or looking at, that they've been taught to, to put the blind eye towards, okay? And so we, we're taught this stuff in society. I was taught to take this stuff on because of who I am, because of what I look like, so that the community would be bonded and stronger. But as a kid, I grew up in a neighborhood where I was called half a nigger, quarter nigger, semi nigger, right? Yellow boy, piss colored, all this shit. Everything except black by black people. When it was convenient, I was called black. Mm. White people didn't know what to call me. So they just stayed away from me and called me Puerto Rican. Puerto Rican said, hey, papi, get that. <laughs> right? And, right? And so I, I moved in all these different spaces. And yet I was taught to deny anything other than black. And we it. see it show up as like a, like you were talking about a turmoil inside yeah. and we see it with like two different religious parents too. Yeah. Where internally, if we're taught that like, if he's only going to honor his blackness and deny anything else, it can be a war inside the self because you have to reject a part. Yeah. So just like other parts work. And I'm seeing that now in the psychedelic community where someone's like, I'm 6% Native American Cherokee. Yeah. And so it's like all of a sudden that one carries the most weight. But then you're, there's a denial of self of 93 or 94%. <coughs> and I've watched in Journey where people are shape-shifting between the different constructs and it, they're literally battling for harmony. And so especially right now with so much talk in the psychedelic space around decolonizing and shifts that need to happen and reciprocity, it almost is creating more shame for people that have any whiteness in their system as a result too, because 
it still translates into then where are we colonized that we are denying within the self because those are our ancestors too. And so we see whether it's a Jewish mother and a Mormon bishop, two different religious beliefs, or it's the mother wants the kid to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer, and the father says, do whatever you want, be an artist. That's two different constructs of operating. And so a child can have turmoil, and that's what Ta's going to cover now, multi-construct strain, because those two things really can't live in harmony together unless there are new constructs developed. And so for us, it's not a removal of constructs. It's a redesign and a reconstruction so that you're... We love constructs. This building's a construct. It's keeping us air conditioned and in a very pleasant space. So it's more when you recognize the constructs that were placed on you and you were placed in. And re- we see it show up in stomach issues. Mm-hmm. We see it show up in allergies. We see it in autoimmune issues. It's literally rejection of self. Yeah. And so doing like parts integration and stuff like that, like 100% shows up. It, thank you, Cole. This is a big deal, Taylor, and thank you for asking the question. Mm -hmm. I get asked this quite a lot. And when people ask me, when people say, oh, that's Ta. Ta is not who I am. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to make this really clear to all of y'all. Ta is not who I am. It is the sound that I respond to. Mm -hmm. When you say Ta, this that you're looking at is responding to the sound. I love that sound. It's what I lean into. Okay. That sound has been resonant in my life, my whole life. My daughter used to call that woman Tata, okay? And I had no idea why she called her Tata. She, it was the whole thing. And my name evolved into what it is, okay? The, I'm telling you, you're a big part of my life, girl. And you, don't, you have no idea how deep it is. So this, all of this stuff is very important when you're navigating your own shit. Who are you? And if you ascribe to what people have told you you are, are you going to be a slave to that? Are you going to create the person that you are inside, that you've chosen to be? And are you going to put yourself around people who accept you for who you choose to be right now and who you're mutating into tomorrow, who you're going to be next week? And if you want to throw all this shit away, are they still down for you? That's what it's about for me. Mm -hmm. You feel me? And so as I peel all these layers back and I start to see all these things that are going on inside me, I am able to support other people in moving through these spaces. I believe this. One of the reasons I'm so awesome at the shit that I do is because I've been through so much around my own traumas, my hair trauma, my skin trauma, my, my race trauma, just all of this, the sexual, tra- all of these things that live in this body that I've been so blessed to be in. It's, it's a body. I mean, I'm blessed to look at it. It's <laughs> right? a good one. But this is the thing, y'all. <laughs> this is the thing with constructs is we live in these spaces and we believe that these things are what we are. This is a belief structure. I am in full doubt of being black, of being white. All of these, I doubt all of this shit because they are belief structures. But I know foundationally what I am is I'm sourcey poo. I'm a part of source. I am a piece of source. That's it foundationally that's my knowledge and i can spring from there and do whatever else i want with that and i'm playing with this i'm here to play remember what we said at the beginning of today y'all and most importantly don't forget to play this is your game you can do what you want with it or you can let the game do it to you it's all on you fam it's all on you what do you want to do with it Mm. nice deep breath y'all And then when we have relationships develop and you have people that this is my idea of marriage, this is my idea of marriage, and they don't actually communicate it because they don't understand the constructs that created where they're operating from. And so then those start to come into play with multi-construct strain. Just dialing in online. How y'all doing? Can I get a thumbs up if y'all are safe? Hey, Todd, Zer has something? Yeah. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hey. Um, So I'm Zer Oya. I have more of a share than a question, if it's okay. Yes? Okay. So last time when we got to a multi-construct strain, I sat in my seat and I was just like, ooh. Like, and I, I started like working through the process, questioning like, which one of my constructs, like, are they battling each other, right? But then I sat back and I realized, so I was born 
Roderick Angelo Bell Jr. My mom wanted to name me Christopher Justice at some point before my biological father said, hey, no. Then I came out, got denied by my family, and I dropped Roderick altogether. So then I became Angelo. And then on the streets of Baltimore City, when I left the cozy white picket fence house, I became Low Bell. Low, like sh Shorty Low, whatever. Then there was Gabrielle LaBelle Blue when I had my drag era. And then there was Phoenix when I first started sex working. For the, I, was in, I was a massage therapist, or <laughs> massage therapist. That I mean, that's legitimate work. That wasn't making money because I didn't know that I was supposed to do more. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and then there was Sir Oya with the S. And then I had another awakening where I was like, wait, I'm, but I'm more, I'm divine. So then I started to, to slide into like the divinity of being in the middle ground and being gender non-conforming. So then that S became an X and it became Zer Oya. And then it became Mixter Oya because I got recognized by my community. Say all this to say, at any given moment, I am all of them. Mm -hmm. Like when you see me confidently showing up in makeup, there was a time when I was pretending to be someone else, lip syncing and all the things and entertaining. But, I, but at baseline value, I just enjoy being seen as like pretty when I want to be seen as pretty. So like there's an upside to doing the work of addressing your construct strain for you to fully have the sovereignty to show up however the fuck you feel like it, when you feel like it, and in power. I just wanted to lean onto that like light note. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you fam. <sighs> nice deep breath, everybody. Hey. <sighs> All right. Multi-construct strain. <clears throat> I don't know where the image went, bro. The image is gone. What kind of stuff? What's going on with my slides, bro? So when a person ascribes to multiple constructs at once and the constructs clash with one another, we have multi-construct strain, okay? They're pulling you in different directions. The body only functions in the moment of right now, okay? And so you can be pulled into all kinds of directions and thought about things later on and all this other stuff. Your heart and your spirit can travel through dimensions and time and space. Your mind can travel into the future and the past but the body can only be here right now. And so when you're dwelling on constructs from the past and you're applying them to constructs from the future, things can get really tumultuous inside, okay? You're going to be a lawyer when you grow up. I got thrown out of class when I was a kid because the teachers were asking, Who, what do you want to be? And it was the, I want to be a fireman. I want to be the president. I was like, I just want to be myself. Get out. Why do I need to get out? I just want to be me. And I said this shit from when I was a kid. I spent most of my grade school time in the principal's office for being resistant. Let me get rid of this thing here. So the body can only be in the moment and now. It's a present culmination of past experiences and current beliefs. These are not my slides. Okay. Recognizing the impact of social constructs and how they show up in the body can help move things by recognizing where the issues may be rooted. That is not, where did my slides go? This is not my slides. All right, cool. We're going to get out of this. And it's right, right now. Right, right now. I'm stopping this. I don't know where my construct slides are. Multi construct strain. If I am in a position where, like Taylor was saying, I have. The I'm black and then I'm the light skinned black person and I'm Catholic and I'm straight and I'm a son and I'm a father. I'm all these different things. They can be clashing and pulling. And my body is only in the moment of now. And so if everything is in reference to later and the past, 
I get pulled into all these different directions and it's tumultuous for the body. It's disruptive and destructive to the body. Because if I'm in a fear space because my constructs are traumatized, I may not know where things are coming from. Okay? And so it may not make sense to me. Why do I feel this way? I got three or four calls yesterday and the day before because I did a, a, a Facebook, Instagram live on money and I started talking about constructs and people were like, I don't have all this stuff happening in my body and I don't know why. It doesn't make sense to me. And after I got on the calls with people, it was evident that these people had more than one construct pulling at them at the same time. What was going on? From when they were a kid, they were told they should act a certain way. They didn't want to act that way, but they did it anyway. Then they got pushed into something else. Then they got pushed into something else and something else. And then those constructs started to fight with one another inside. And so the constructs were being traumatized by the other constructs inside this person. And so now you have this constant fight or flight sequence going on in the background and somebody's getting anxious because they're thinking the construct is driving thoughts of the future of what might happen. And the other thought, the other construct is driving thoughts of the future of what might happen. And so the person is doing this. They're nervous inside. They don't know why. And so this is unconscious programming that we have, y'all. And a lot of this have to do with our identity constructs and our social constructs and the things that we claim the things that we've been told to claim. Cole and I have had to do some serious unraveling with people that have been indoctrinated into some really deep religious spaces because they don't know who they are. We've been doing a lot of work in Utah with people who are leaving. The Mormon religion is having an exodus right now, a mass exodus. People are leaving in droves, and they're finding out things that, that they believe their whole lives. And they have evidence that things are not true the way they were told. And it's frightening for them. And so they have things that are tearing them up inside because now they don't know what to believe and they don't know what they know. And so supporting people and getting to a space where they know what they know, you coming up? Yeah. Supporting people who come into a space of actually knowing what they know is a big deal. And so when you have multiple constructs pulling on one another, they can cause you to have a lot of physiological things that don't make sense. And when we talk about the logic ceiling, I'm going to dive more into that. And I think we're talking about the logic ceiling tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I'm not going to get super deep in, in another concept right now because this is a lot. Okay? This is a lot of shit. And this may be stirring stuff up for you. Even the people that have been here multiple times, every time you hear this shit, it stirs something else up. Mm -hmm. Because maybe you weren't ready to hear something. Maybe this is challenge stuff and, and you got to do the work with yourself at home. And now you're coming in here and it's like, okay, I'm ready to move to the next space. This is why we want you to do the corner approach three times before you start really teaching this shit to people. Because this is your work. If you don't know who you are, right? <laughs> I don't know who I am. <laughs> okay? I don't. And so for me to sit here and tell you that I know who I am, I don't. It changes all the time. It's convenient to believe that I I'm a black man, American. It's convenient. I don't have to think about it. But when I sit with myself and I'm like, who the fuck am I right now? I don't want to be in this situation right now. I'm, I am the organism that doesn't want to be in this situation right now. Or I'm the person who wants to do this. I want to go lick that salt wall at Kuya, right? They have this salt, this uh, huge, they have a huge Himalayan salt wall. And I've been thinking about going in and just going, <laughs> right? Just why not? I'm the person who wants to do that shit. But this is the thing. It changes from moment to moment. And if you can't recognize what you change from moment to moment, you're probably locked in some kind of construct or you're willingly in some kind of construct. And there's nothing wrong with this, y'all. There's nothing wrong with your religions. There's nothing wrong with your nationalities. There's nothing wrong with any of this stuff if that's where you want to be. And that's okay. But it's your choice. And if you don't have a choice... Now you do. What are you going to do with that? And do you create the community structure, that, the construct that you want to support you in that? This is why Cole and I are doing our relationship the way we do it. It's always a new relationship. And if we get, it was it September 3rd, right? Yeah, September 3rd. You every, remember better than I yeah. do. <laughs> September 3rd, every year we sit down and we rehash the shit. And if we need to do it in the middle of the year, we do it in the middle of the year. If we have some stuff come up. 
where we are constantly creating a new relationship, y'all, mm -hmm. with ourselves and each other. And this is why it matters whether you're going into a ceremony or you're holding space for someone else, because understanding some of their cultural conditionings is really important. So in the conscious space, they're good with each other and they feel safe. But when you have deeper conditionings and constructs that are working through a person, the second though, two different women, the second they didn't feel safe, everything shut down, complete dissociation. If you send someone out of a journey that's highly dissociated, their potential to be a target of crime and victimization is like 10x because the frequency they're leaving in is so dissociated that attracts certain kind of predatory energy. It's like a wounded animal that's all by itself out in the field. And so it's really important to understand some of these cultural things in an intake process because the more aware I continue to get, I don't claim to even have a fraction of an idea, but I am always dedicated to understanding more, not because I'm going to determine or decide where someone should be, but I want to ask more questions so we can really understand what else might be in their system or their body. What I started to do when I started to get in particular with the black women in my community in Brooklyn is more women wanted to sit with me than I ensured I always had a woman sitting next to me that represented more people in the room because it's really important to have representation for certain processes because a person's body will automatically feel safer. Same with queer, non-binary, trans, all of this matters. So if you start noticing that you're getting certain demographics and you don't have anyone in your community that can be a representative or a safe space for them, it's another place to explore. Otherwise, we're kind of trying to mind our way around nervous systems. And once someone closes off, Harry, can you hand me that puzzle ball thing? In essence, what happens, and we're going to talk about this tomorrow, someone comes into an expanded space. They're in spirit. They feel amazing, wonderful. It only takes one thing in their system to completely shut them down. And it's not just going to open just because you tell them they're safe or their mind tells them they're safe. Their nervous system, their vagal tone is not there. And so for us, that's why for in the intake process, the more you understand how the constructs within yourself, you see them in other people and it just makes you ask different questions. I'm not big on the, we're big on radical consent, but I'm also really dedicated to sovereignty and radical self-responsibility too. It's having honest conversations with people of what other concerns or just kind of things I'm curious about. If I have an all women's group and one male bodied person wants to come, I'm not going to just say, no, you can't. I explain the container if it was meant to be a co-ed or all inclusive. It's a conversation to say, hey, you're actually the only, we'll say Roots wants to come to an all women's retreat, right? Some people might say, oh, well, it's all women, so we're not going to do that. But what you might not understand is if the intention initially was for different gender dynamics, this might be the one time that a man is fully seen in a container of women in a different way or steps into their power in a different way or whatever. So it's merely just speak what's there. Just be honest of what, if you have a concern, say it. Or if you're going to a retreat and you have a concern and any facilitator that won't hold space for your concern for me is not my facilitator. That doesn't demonize them or make them wrong. But for me, I'm a very inquisitive person and some, I've had people say, look, Cole, if you're going to come, I just need you to trust me because this is some control things that I'm seeing, but they'll have a conversation with me. Then I'll trust them. But I, if someone's like, you just need to trust me. Yeah, that's what I've heard in the past. And I'm barely alive because of it, or I barely survived because of it. So if that, if I'm not being met in that space, I'm not interested. So it's really just the more that you understand how, like for the more in, especially in Utah, it's a fascinating process because everyone is so nice that anything that might go against their identity of being nice, total shutdown or dissociation from it, especially with like systemic racism, gender dynamics, or I'm all inclusive of everyone, just not in front of me or, you know, I love all people. But the second they sense any systemic racism working through them, it's total denial but it's the fear that my identity is being threatened because I believe myself to be a good and loving person. And if that's true, then what if I'm not? So I must associate or run. 
And so the more that I got that awareness within myself, that's when I would recognize where certain places hit racism working through me systemically and racist, not the same thing. And the more that I allowed myself to fully understand that and see where the dissociation came from, the first time he came to visit my family in Utah, he goes, I am so impressed with you. (laughs) (laughs) Because to see where I've come to from what my conditioning and environment was is so different. So And what that's required. That's why for us, constructs are not bad things. And we want to, we really want to stress that it's not bad. It's recognizing if it's not working for you, how do you want to renegotiate, change it, get rid of some, whatever. Just like if I'm going to be in a box, bitch, I'm going to decorate it. I like boxes and windows and houses and decor. I'm here for that. I don't like when other play people force me into one that I'm not comfortable in, that I don't feel safe in. Other than that, it's like, do you? Does it make sense with construct strain, right? So if you had a mother that was like, look, a good man does this, and then you go into open relationships or different dynamics or have a child super young and the mother's ideas of how a child should be raised and you're not a real man or all of that shit, multi-construct strain. So as you go through this evening, and that's why when we said constructs and people are like, "Uh uh-oh, here we go, because it starts to kick some things in. It's not uncommon to feel hip pain, back pain, tightness a little bit. It's merely observing that we are pushing on things that want to survive, and it's okay. That's why we have support here. That's what this is for. I really want to thank you for being here in this space, for caring for yourselves and for leaning into this. You, if this is challenging for you, it's okay. Remember that trauma is comes from something being threatened. And if your constructs have been latched into your nervous system your whole life, if they've been integrated into your nervous system and they're starting to get shaken up, they may be really frightened. And so there was a conversation that I had in this room earlier when we did the breakouts where I was speaking to parts of a person, okay? And it was an interesting space and you got to check in and dial. I'm not a threat to any of those parts, but if those threats perceive me as unsafe, They will cause dissociation. They will cause panic. They will cause all kinds of bodily things to come online. Let your constructs know that, hey, I'm just checking you out. (laughs) I'm just having a conversation. Because if they're threatened, they can cause you to dissociate, right? And I just want to bring that into the table here. Moving Moving your constructs and your identities from one space to another or creating a new construct Go easy with yourself. Please be gentle with this stuff. It's not, this is not work for the faint of heart. So if you start having any body stuff, if you have any short, shortness of breath or anything, hit one of teeth. teeth, just observe and write it in your journal and just keep an eye on it as you start to make a transition into a new self. Integration is not optional.